I introduce to you Mr. Ishwar Puri. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. I am very happy to be here in the Twin Cities again and to see many friends in the audience. Many new friends too. Is there anybody who has never seen me before? You raise your hands. Thank you. Thank you, new friends. Nice to welcome you. The subject of this evening's talk has been just announced. 1990, a world in change. The truth is the world has been changing every year. Sometimes I look at some old newspapers in newspaper offices or in old libraries and pull out newspapers of about 100 years old, 50 years, 75 years old. Sometimes one is shocked to see that they look so contemporary, that the same kind of changes were taking place then which are taking place now. And the same kind of uh, prophets of doom were sitting at that time predicting what's going to happen in the next three years, five years, and specific dates are mentioned when the world will come to an end. And the same thing is happening now. There were also great optimists who said this is the greater age of enlightenment coming. The Kali Yuga is changing to Satya Yuga. They are going to have the golden age. And uh, these same things have been said for the last hundred years or whatever records we can find. It appears that change is constantly taking place in the world. But we somehow like to see the moment of change which is with us now. We like to see now, what's happening now, what is our role in it. When I came to study in this country in the 60s, I went to school at Harvard. There were very uh, deep thinkers there, intellectuals, scholars, learned people, learned professors and students who were constantly looking at the change taking place. And one thing that they shared with me again and again was, this is a period in which we have an important role to play. As I moved in the rest of the country in the years later on, I found more and more people who thought this was an age, a period in which we have a particular role to play, that the change is no longer a change which we witness, it is a participative change in which we have to play a role. And what is that role? From talking about simple political change, social change, change in the third world countries, change of poverty to riches, change of economic conditions in different areas of the planet, they began to move more and more towards an idea about a spiritual change, a change in thinking based upon experience with the other changes, that we have seen enough of social change, we have seen enough of economic change, we have seen poverty, and we have seen affluence. And with this change, we have come to the conclusion that a different kind of change is needed, a change in our own spiritual understanding, a change which will affect people in a way as to generate a better resource for happiness than the other changes have done. People used to talk of meditation in the 50s as a very strange kind of a fad which had come from the East. Today, I find meditation being introduced in certain corporations as a corporate way of life. Business corporations, which thought this was not at all part of business, are today inviting people to teach meditation to corporate executives so that they can do their jobs in the corporation better. The word meditation is no longer anathema to the corporate world. This is a change. At one time, vegetarianism was something to be decried. The nutritionist wouldn't look at a vegetarian. That fellow, he lacks proteins, doesn't get the right kind of amino acids. This is something you'll never be able to live with. Eat the food for the men, food, real food. Real food is all meat. Today, they talk of cholesterol, they talk of vegetarianism, as if it is an accepted thing. Nutritionists talk of vegetarian food 
as if it is something that they always knew. But there's a change. These changes are taking place. There are people sitting in mass meditation. Some of them say, if a few thousand people could sit together in meditation, the mass effect of that meditation would be such as to bring about the greatest change. Some of these meditators who have assembled at different places on this planet have claimed that all these social changes now taking place in Europe and elsewhere are a result of that meditation. They are directly linking a practice like meditation to social and political change taking place which was never possible 30, 40 years ago. So there is a constant change and we are constantly placed in the middle of that change. And the question arises, what is our role in that change? Is change inevitable or can we stop change? I have seen a lot of people participating in change. I have not been able to find any successful crusader who said, I am going to stop change. I have never seen anybody. I met thousands, hundreds of thousands of people around the world who are participating in change, talking about change, seeing how they can relate, but not met anybody who could say, I want to stop and say there is some place, some moment that there is no change. As Ed said earlier, it appears the only thing that doesn't change is change. The change is constant and therefore we cannot stop change. Now consider the situation in which we are placed. Individual, conscious human beings placed in the midst of change. Change took place a minute ago before I started talking to you. Change will take place a minute later. Change, will, change took place a second ago and will take place a second later. What about now? Does now undergo a change? What about the real now? <clears throat> Not a now in terms of five minutes or ten minutes or two seconds. The real now, that point in time from where we can see ahead and see behind in the past. The point from where we can see both. Does any change take place in that now? It's a big question. It's a very big question. Because people who try to answer this question first try to stay at now and they find they can't do it. There is no way for a person, even momentarily, even for a second, even for a minutest moment to stop at that timeless now and see what is happening now around which change is taking place in the past and the future. There must be a point because change is taking place from moment to moment. <clears throat> when we go and see a movie and the film goes through the projector and flickers and creates a change, it is a change created by the rapid movement of different still pictures. But if you could stop the projector on any still picture, you could see that particular picture had no movement and no change. In fact, you would find that none of the pictures had any change. That if only one image could be kept in front, it would have no change. That when you combine a number of images and go from image to image, you create change. Has anybody ever thought that this life we are leading, this world we are witnessing, this universe that is around us is functioning exactly on the same basis? That there is a series of nows which have no change. But when taken together and put into the framework of time, change becomes inevitable, inescapable. That it should be possible to stop in time at one now and see that there is no change. Has anybody ever done it? Is it possible to do it? The perfect living masters were mystics adept in knowledge about change and knowledge about time, they say anyone can do it. All of us sitting here can do it and experience that moment which is timeless, which has no change, but around which all the change takes place. And if you learn 
how to stop at now without change, you can understand the nature of change. That there is no way to understand the nature of change except by being able to stop and say, where is change taking place? A movie camera is a good example because we can go slide by slide, image by image, piece by piece and say between one piece and another there is a change in the image but the piece by itself is still the same. You have to put that together to see movement and change. What kind of images are we holding that are creating change? Is change a result of the spectator? The, the witness or is change taking place somewhere else? One of the greatest scientists of modern times and of all history, in fact, Einstein, he gave a new answer and he investigated this question as to what he was witnessing was relative to time and velocity of light or was it a continuum existing independently of the observer. Time and velocity of light were connected with the vantage point an observer had. In his last essay, Einstein said, I have been unable to complete my work in the area of the role of the observer in finding out the nature of time and relativity. That he was able to find the famous equations on which we could understand the continuum of time and space, but he did not go deep enough. He did not have the time to go into the question of the role of the observer, around whom all this change is taking place. That role of the observer, around which change is taking place, is as important today as it was in Albert Einstein's time or any other time. Does the observation create the change? Does the observation have any relationship with change? Or is an observer merely a tragically entrapped consciousness in a movement of change that is taking place irrespective of that person? Let's take the example of a person who goes to sleep and has a dream. In the dream, things move. The person can go riding, can go on a train, can drive a car, can sit on a chair, watch people come and go, can argue, can shout, can be peaceful, can fly, can go into the sky, can go to heaven, can achieve spiritual progress, can do anything and wake up and find it was a dream. What happened to that person during all these experiences of change? The observer seeing a person sleeping and having the dream only at best says there are rapid eye movements, horizontal and vertical, and there are some movements of the limbs and position of the body correlating with all the changes that took place. The change that took place in the dreamer in the wakeful state or his physical body had hardly anything to do with all the changes the dreamer experience in the dream. Yet we are trying to prove that those little changes that were taking place in the physical body were responsible for the sequences of change that took place as a dream. If a person goes into deep dream or meditational dream or a meditational transcendental experience which reduces the pulse rate changes the, alters the character of the EKG patterns that are coming up on the machine. If all those are studied and a person goes into deep meditation, we find the change becomes minimal. There is no rapid eye movement. There is no movement of the body. There is very little movement of the lungs, which is breathing. The heart slows down. And the person is seeing even more change than in a dream. What is the relationship then? Therefore, it would be a good hypothesis to say that change is not connected with any change taking place elsewhere, but is connected 
with the positioning of the observer of change, with the positioning of consciousness. What consciousness is doing creates the change. If consciousness is at a particular level experiencing something, then the change takes place according to that level and that experience. If the level of the consciousness shifts from there, nature of change alters. It's all right for social scientists trapped in looking at the changes taking place around to only study the change outside. But for those with greater insight who want to understand the true nature of change, it is necessary to come back to one's own self and see what is the role of the observer in this change. Sometimes we come across very strange people. I have come across strange people in life in whose presence things happen differently. I don't know if you ever come across such a person that things are in a bad shape, nothing is happening right, there's a lot of anger amongst people, and then somebody, somebody comes up and while that person is present, things happen differently. And it is so noticeable that one attributes that person was there, that's why things happened like this. Has anyone noticed that? Anyone of you has noticed that? Please raise your hands. Thank you. What is the role of that person who comes and alters change by doing nothing about change? Where is the effect? What is the effect of that person on the rest of movement and rest of change that is taking place that there is an alteration in change? If you link this with my previous statements, you will find that the effect of such a person is not on the molecules and the atoms of the space around him, but on the consciousness of the observer, and therefore there is an alteration in the change. Many years ago, I used to suggest a simple formula to my friends who were seeking happiness. They said it's the most difficult thing to find. It's very rare, and one who has found it has found the best thing one can find. And I had suggested that instead of trying to search for happiness, be happy yourself. And if you don't know how to be happy, pretend to be happy. If you don't know how to smile, pretend to smile. Practice it. Get up in the morning, look in the mirror, smile. And stay smiling all day. And then, at the end of a week of uh, research, let me know if something happened. 90% of people who tried this at the end of the week reported that everybody was so happy. The whole world had changed. They didn't tell anybody to change. They did not suggest to anybody change. They said everybody was so friendly, was so good, that looked like it was a different world. If this can happen by pretending to be happy, you can imagine what can happen if you are really happy. <laughs> Real happiness in one's own self alters the perspective from which the observer looks at life and the whole life changes. Real change can take place when the observers witnessing that change also change. When people talk of a new order, a new world, a new decade, turn of the century, a new age is coming on this planet, the new age will arise not because of the changes in the matter, not because of changes in the molecules of this universe, but the change in the attitude of the observer. As the people inhabiting this planet become happy, the whole planet will become happy. Experiments have been conducted that if you are happy and sing a song and whistle in the mornings, if any plants are there in your room, they grow better. Anybody seen that? This has been experimented now. The people don't want to believe these things easily. Now they want to test it out scientifically. And scientifically they found out if you are mad and angry and always scolding people, the plants wither and they die. Plants, we are talking of that form of life, that level of consciousness, which does not respond in the same way as pets and animals and human beings. Even plants are affected. Therefore, you can imagine how the happiness of the individual can change the world. If the individuals can find happiness, the whole world will change. It is a prediction 
of the masters that change is coming very soon on this planet where more and more observers and inhabitants will be happy and that will change the whole world change the earth it will not only change other human beings it will change animals change their pets change wild animals change the trees change the foliage change everything it will even change the weather and the climate this kind of effect upon a whole planet based upon the change taking place in, internally in an observer of that planet it's a great thing very few people are able to link the two together but if you look at it experiment with it you will find the interrelation between the internal change of an observer and the change in the world that he or she is observing therefore i am willing to agree in fact i heartily agree that at the turn of the century big changes are taking place but i do not believe that the change is taking place only because of social revolution or violence or because of other political movements the basic change i see is in the awareness of people changing so that there is more happiness in them than they have today happiness is the secret of change in this world of course what will lead to a pursuit of happiness will be the experience with all the other changes that have taken place up to this point all social changes economic changes political changes that are taking place are means to an end they are not the end they are that is not the change we are talking about the big change we are talking about the world in change in the 90s starting from 1990 which is the first year of the 90s the decade which leads into the turn of the century this is a great year it opens a decade of great change in the individual and as a result of the change in the individual there is change in the world what makes me so optimistic why should i feel that 90s are so important and why didn't it happen earlier the reason why i am optimistic is that it happened earlier also it happened in certain sections of this planet it happened here and there it happened several times in the east in history it happened in some sections of the midwest some of you know how i have taken up a globe of the world of this planet and drawn a, a strip a strip like this starting from the north japan sea and taking about a 1000 miles strip and taking it right across right up to the left bank of the african continent and in that strip i have found people have undergone changes just by the appearance of a few persons of such magnetic personality radiating such happiness that those who met them became happy and that whole area became happy the whole planet did not get covered up by that but that strip was an experiment when i went to california and uh, las vegas in the 60s i saw sunset strip and other strips there big strip there <laughs> and i found that the strips in the evening are creating the kind of happiness people were looking for so i wanted to distinguish the strip on my globe that i drew up from those strips so i instead of calling it the sunset strip i called it the sunrise strip <laughs> those events which happened in that part of the earth where people felt happy because of the changes taking place in the awareness of the individuals those experiences showed where the secret lies how happiness cannot be acquired by running after things that are the point of observation happiness can be acquired by altering the observer not that what you observe that happiness is not acquired by running after something but by just observing it that the observer must change within to get happiness and not by running after a thing to acquire it and possess it the more we ran after material things the more materialist we became we became rich we became affluent but we became unhappy from a distance i used to think sitting in india 
Here's a great country, God's own country, United States. All the riches. They made so much money. Every family can have a television. They generally have two cars. They, can, they have cheap gasoline. They run all the time. In fact, once the greatest wonder in my mind was, if one day the American population decided to stop driving, where will they park the cars? <laughs> There's no place. This kind of country, I looked at, I said, they must be the happiest people on earth. And I came here and I looked around. A lot of people were smiling. A lot of people were talking in a nice way, wearing nice clothes, going shopping in big malls. And then I began to make friends and meet people individually. The more I met them, the more I talked to them, the more I understood their personal lives, I was shocked at the state of unhappiness that everyone was going through. I could not find a single happy person. Those who looked happy required two days to be with them. If, if they were still happy, spend another day. In about a week, nobody was happy. As they told their internal stories, as they told the events of their life, as they told the values that they cherish, as they figured out what went wrong, first with the things and then with the people around them, as they told those stories, how the things and the people were all responsible for making them unhappy. Nobody said, I am unhappy because of what is happening inside my head. They said, I am unhappy because what that person said. Did you hear that? That's why I'm unhappy. Did you see what happened? I lost everything. Are you expecting me to be happy? These are things which were so obvious that even the facade, even the external appearance of happiness with all the affluence, all the change, the social, the economic, the political change, the so-called independence, the so-called freedom of the individual, the so-called civil rights, all these put together could not change the nature of the observer who was unhappy. Why was the observer unhappy? Why was individual consciousness of an affluent country, of an affluent society, of a society with freedom and democracy, why was the consciousness of the individual that was a member of that society unhappy? That member was unhappy because the member could not get what they wanted to get. If they wanted to make a thousand dollars, they did not make it. They were unhappy. If they made it, they wanted to make five thousand. Therefore, they were unhappy. If they made five thousand, they wanted to make a million. Therefore, they were unhappy. If they made a million, they saw another person who made 10 million, they were unhappy. Even after making what they wanted to make, they did not make what somebody else was making, they were unhappy. People began to base their status and their happiness on what other people were doing, not on what they were doing. This was a strange experience that you had put your own happiness hostage in the hands of your friends and foes together. People you like and people you don't like are responsible for your happiness. In this state, most people are unhappiness. But why were they unhappy? They could have found the friends and said, come on, we don't want to compete. We don't want to race. Let's enjoy freedom and happiness together. They tried that too. They tried to see if we can find the kind of friendship which will resolve the problem of competition and give happiness. When they tried to find a friend, they could not find a friend. They said, this is a friend. But the friend was there for six months. After that, that friend let us down. If he didn't let us down in six months, he did after 12 months, or two years, or five years. At some point in time, every friend let us down. What kind of friendship was that? We were basing our friendship on expectations which did not come about. When friendship is lost, you may have all the affluence, you can collect everything you like, then friendship is lost, you cannot be happy. That was the truth. People had everything. With a friend, they would go and do shopping and enjoy the shopping, enjoy the clothes. What wonderful thing, buy flowers, they were pretty. And when there was no friend or the friend let you down, you wouldn't look at those clothes, you would throw those flowers away. There was nothing in the clothes or the flowers. You lost a friend. 
and everybody lost a friend. What kind of society was that? That we reached a point where there was no friendship. When there is no friendship, then comes the greatest cause of unhappiness, which afflicts the inner core of consciousness, and that is loneliness. You are alone. There was really nobody with you. And one is alone, one is automatically unhappy. Therefore, all this change and all this wealth gathering and all this social change and all these great values and all these great crusades and all these big marches and parades led to a very sham state of affairs in which the inner part of the human being was unhappy because the inner part was lonely. To overcome loneliness, we try to make new friends. Maybe this one is the right one. Yes, talks like me, thinks like me, eats like me, speaks like me, drinks like me. So similar, this must be the real friend, must be a soul mate, must have been made somewhere else in heaven. How could you be so close? And soul mates who were so close, when they came closer, they found they were so different. The ones who were most similar were the worst friends. In a study conducted on friendship, it was found that people with similar ideas never make good friends. This study was conducted recently, but even in the 16th, 17th century, Lord Chancellor Francis Bacon, in writing an essay on friendship, said there can be no friendship amongst equals. Because he found when you are equal, you fight. How can there be friendship? You want to show off. The human ego is too strong to accept a friend who is equal. Therefore, friendship between people who are of the same type, same nature, same status is not possible. In the 60s and 70s, there was a, a company that wanted to do the mating game through computers. There are even some companies doing now that through computers they will find out your tastes, your choices, your interest and find out your mate based upon those choices. It didn't take them very long to find out that if you find a mate, you find a partner with the same tastes, that partnership never lasts. Only those partnerships lasted where the interests were not similar but complementary, which means different. Where one was strong, the other was weak. Where one was weak, the other was strong. Those friendships lasted for a while. Those partnerships lasted. The complementarity principle worked, not the principle of equality. But when we want to overcome our loneliness on this planet, our loneliness, which is exuding unhappiness, exuding anger, exuding resentment, when that affects the whole planet, and we want to be truly happy in this situation, we try to find the answer to our loneliness still outside. We want to go outside. We want to look around, where is that person who can make me happy? Where is the person I can make happy? And people are in search of persons to find happiness. They have never said, where is myself that can find happiness? Where is the real secret? Where is it coming from? Why am I lonely? How come I am lonely in the midst of such a big crowd created around me? What is the nature of loneliness? People don't study that. And therefore, there is no real change towards happiness. A change is towards loneliness, resentment, anger, unhappiness. When people are looking at other people, it doesn't take long to find out the relationship is skin deep. Sometimes lower skin type, dermis, epidermis. I don't know how far it goes. It doesn't go to the heart. People use the word heart in such a metaphorical terms. If somebody really took the heart out, nobody will go after that person. But the skin, yes, that's real. Skin deep relationships have not overcome loneliness. We have seen that over and over again. And you can have a relationship and you talk to a person, you can be very intimate and then you find, but there is no real understanding. I can't even express what is inside me. Leave, leave aside another person understanding me. Is that not our experience? Our experience is that reliance upon another person for understanding to overcome loneliness has never worked. It cannot work. It is not meant to work like that. 
there is something built into our systems, built into our persons, built into our consciousness that prevents this from happening. And so long as human beings are built like that, it will never happen. Throughout history, it has never happened. And that particular part of human consciousness that makes sure that human beings cannot really seek overcoming loneliness by finding other human beings is called the human ego, the front part, the face of the human mind, the thinking mind, the thoughts have a face, the thoughts, when they, when the thoughts go in our head, they have a face, a countenance, which they present outside. And that face which they present is called ego. The human ego does not allow happiness to come from another human being. When two human beings want to enter into partnership for happiness, they find what breaks it up is their ego. Look back. Has it ever happened that you have found two people not being able to understand each other for any other reason except ego? Human ego, human vanity. I, I, I know better. I should have done this. He did that to me. She did that to me. I, I, me, me is what is creating all the unhappiness. I told somebody the other day to spend one month without using the word I. It's difficult to go three days. I is so prominent. If you want to observe yourself not using I, you'll find you are a totally different person. With I and without I, you are a totally different person. The person who has such a strong I, the strong ego, has a very great problem. The problem is that that I wants to be always right and wants to do it in a very subtle way. For example, the I that wants to be always right after a dispute, after an argument, will say, I know I am wrong. I am always wrong. Have you ever heard that? That's a claim to rightness. <laughs> this I is used in every possible way. I that says I am the greatest is not affecting us so deeply as the I that says, I am the humblest, I am the servant of everybody, I am everything, because the I knows to be humble and to be servant is the greatest. There is a great trick. There is no greater trick that we, deception that we play upon ourselves than through the use of our ego and our I. One Indian mystic once said, there is no barrier to happiness except the ego. But then the next sentence that mystic spoke was very strange. That mystic said, there is no barrier to happiness except our ego. And there is no solution to this problem except our ego. That looks strange. In the first sentence, the human ego, the I-ness, is supposed to be responsible for all this unhappiness. And then in the second sentence it says that that very ego can become a solution to the problem. How does that happen? The answer has been given by the mystics who say, unless you seek, you cannot find. And you cannot seek if you have no eye, or eye of the seeker. The eye of the seeker is different from the eye who looks for friendship in another person. But they both reside in the same consciousness. If there is no ego at all, if there is no individuality, no individual identity in a human being, that human being can never become a seeker of anything, not even seeker of happiness. Therefore, the very I, which is responsible for unhappiness, when converted to the I of a seeker of happiness within, becomes the solution to the problem of the ego and of unhappiness. The same enthusiasm, the same energy, the same vigor which goes out to challenge the world, to, to change the world, if the same enthusiasm and the same energy and vigor were to be used within oneself to seek the truth, to seek oneself, to seek happiness, the world would become happy. You don't have to do anything outside. If the eye can be directed to look at the self, instead of looking at the other self, it would be a source of happiness. If a person came 
and ha and was happy i would like to be with that person i'd like to spend all my time if the person runs away i like to chase him if he hides i like to wait for him to find out where he's gone i'd like to spend my time with a person who is happy hoping that the company of that person will make me happy when i do find him even for a little while it gives me happiness i want to spend more time but if i find lot of other friends of mine are also running after the same person i'll say which is a mad rat race who is going to find that person if there are more and more of these people it becomes easier if we have more enlightened people people who have discovered their own self we'd have greater happiness in the universe as a whole the hope for the 90s is that we are entering a stage where after seeing all these big changes in the world we are poised to see the change in ourselves and the number of people who can see this change will be greater than those strange historical events of one person th thousands of years coming up this change that there can be many who can be happy is really going to be the harbinger of the new age or the new age of happiness and i for my limited awareness of the changes that are taking place feel that we are close to this kind of a change in the whole world in the whole planet where people will recognize the importance of looking not at material things but at themselves and finding and having access to such people whom we call perfect living masters people who are like us living in our midst walking about like us but they are perfect in an example in an exemplary way they set an example for us how to find happiness there will be some imperfect ones too there will be imperfect ones who are also happy and there will be perfect ones who are also happy we will be fooled we will think all of them are perfect that they are all happy but we'll find out very soon when we will associate with the imperfect ones they will say come we'll tell you how to find happiness we have the formula in our pocket and we can tell you and we'll give you the happiness follow us send us a check regularly <laughs> and we'll mail the happiness formula to you you'll find out that after a while they are drawing your attention to the same means of happiness you are giving up what will happen to the perfect ones the perfect ones will say we have no formula we don't even know you want to know have the formula find it for yourself within yourself because it lies within yourself the truth is within you find it there they will constantly direct us to go within our own self that's the difference the difference is very little the perfect ones even if they are so remarkable so beautiful we want to run after them we want to never leave them they will not say that just run after us to get happiness there this is temporary find the real thing go within your own self the secret is there even if we tell them look i am getting happiness by seeing you i am getting happiness by being with you why do you send me to go and search in the dark corridors of my own head after closing my eyes and doing meditation that's terrible why can't i get that happiness which i am getting just by enjoying your company and seeing you the imperfect ones will come say come on gather we'll have more feasting and the perfect ones will say don't you want to see this source of happiness forever you only want to have a few moments if you want to see forever go within you will see the same thing that is giving you happiness outside even what is giving you happiness outside is not really outside it is inside that's why you're getting the happiness what looks like a perfect living master is nothing but another being like us who triggers off the happiness inside us not outside the perfect living master is a projection of our own reality which is still within us the reality never leaves us the reality doesn't leave us and walk out but we can't find the reality inside we don't know how to go inside it is difficult to close the eyes and find some sparkle of light even how to find reality there is very difficult therefore we look outside and that symbolic image we call the perfect living master brings us back to a way in which we can find reality within and then we find that symbol stood not for what was outside but what was inside us 
the true spiritual perfect living master is always inside us, never outside. What we see outside is the symbol which can help us to find the truth within. What we see outside as a perfect living master, a human being who has an effect upon us, is merely symbolic of the effect that can be had by following the perfect master who is inside us. That is why the perfect ones will constantly push us back into our own self to find the truth which lies there permanently. Consciousness is not governed by the law of change. What consciousness observes, experiences, is governed by the law of change. The observer is constant, unchanged. What he observes is changing. Therefore, the creation is changing, not the creator. When you watch a show, you watch as the constant observer. The show changes, not the observer. The observer in a permanent now can be permanently unchangeable. Consciousness in its real essence is unchangeable. And therefore, whatever name you give to the consciousness, you call it your soul, you call it your spirit, you call it your higher spirit, you call it God, you call it creator, you call it by any name whatsoever, it's unchangeable. Because it creates and witnesses its own creation, the creation goes through change, but not the creator. How can we find the secret to our own personal satisfaction and through our own personal experience? Is it just a philosophy? Or is it something verifiable? The perfect living masters walking about like ordinary human beings like us, they come and say it is verifiable. It's verifiable now. Whenever we are ready, we can verify. Of course, if we are not ready, we don't want to verify. <clears throat> that, that's where the catch-21 comes. I heard this phrase. I've learned recently catch-21. I don't know if I'm using it properly. Catch-22, I'm corrected now. <laughs> Depend, depends on the age of the person, I guess. <laughs> The catch is, the person says, I want to have a spiritual experience. Sincerely, I really want to have a spiritual experience. Comes along a master, spiritual, spiritually evolved person who has high awareness and can give a spiritual experience to the seeker. They both get together. The seeker says, I want to have a spiritual experience. Can you give me? Sure. That's why I've come. You called me. You wanted a spiritual experience. You called me. I have appeared. Then the seeker says, but I have a little doubt if you are the one I called. You look too ordinary. I thought that even this should be a spiritual experience to be able to see you. He said, even that can be a spiritual experience. Don't have any doubt. And you'll have a spiritual experience. And the seeker says, I want to have a spiritual experience. If I have it, I'll remove my doubts. He says, no, don't have doubt and you'll have it. And they're both stuck in the same position. There's no movement. The, the seeker says, I'll give up my doubts as soon as I have a spiritual experience. And the master says, I will give you spiritual experience the moment you give up doubt. And they pass years and over lifetime. That's catch 22. Maybe 23, I don't know. <laughs> the question is, there was a man who had a house on the bank of a river in India and he had heard of some swamis and yogis who had practiced the art of becoming light in their physical body so that they could walk upon water. He didn't believe it. But one day he saw a man who lived in a little hut outside and whom he had not noticed while building his house, that the man in the early morning would wake up and cross the river walking, go to the other side, chop some wood, which he needed for preparing his food to, to cook, to light a fire. That man would walk on the water and bring the wood walking back on the water, then light up as if nothing had happened. This man washed out of his window. He said, it's incredible. I can't believe it. How does he do it? I have seen with my own eyes. So he went over to him after a few days. He said, every day I watch you walk on the water. How do you do it? Do you have some special kind of shoes or what? 
He said, no, I don't have any shoes at all, in fact. I'm a poor man. I just do my meditation and live in that little hut next to you. I'm your neighbor. He said, what about this walking on water? He said, that's no problem. Anybody can walk on water. You like, you can walk on water. If you like, we'll go to water together. The only requirement is you should have faith that you will not drown. If your consciousness has real faith that you will not drown, you will not drown. That's the secret. He said, uh, well, can I walk with you tomorrow and hold your hand? He said, of course, I'll hold your hand and take you along and we'll both go and come back. This man got so excited at the possibility of walking on water. He called up all his friends. He says, come and watch. I'm going to show you a special yogic trick of walking on water. And I have watched another man do it and we'll both do it together. So many of his friends came up and early morning they were all ready to see him. And he, he got out of his house a long piece of rope. He told one of the friends, look, I'm going to walk for the first time. So I'm going to tie up this rope around me. In case I drown, you pull me out. With the rope around him, when he went with that man, the man walked away and he drowned in the water and he was pulled out quickly. So when the man came back, he said, you said you'll walk with me on the water. He said, yes, but I gave you the condition that you must believe that you will not drown. If you have that kind of faith, then only you can walk on water. The fact you tied the rope around you meant you didn't have that faith. He said, but I would have removed the rope when I had actually walked a few steps. He said, you can't walk even one step with the rope on. This is our approach. A seeker who sincere has this approach, I want to tie a rope so that I have some safety valve. I don't go too far. And then I want to test out whether that claim of happiness is really true. They never found it. And yet there are people around who are going on finding happiness. What is this that makes them tie the rope around? You will find that the very thing that creates evil in the human mind is the cause of that doubt which makes one tie up a rope. The human mind that creates the ego also creates doubt and also creates fear. So this doubt and fear created by the mind does not let us walk on the spiritual path the way we want. It is only when an experimenter comes up and is willing to accept faith as something of importance in his life that we can overcome the hurdle of doubt and walk across the ocean across the ocean of these doubts and loneliness that we are facing here. There are more and more experimenters coming. I have lived in this country now for a few years and I visited many times earlier in the last three, three decades, 60s, 70s, 80s, starting on the fourth decade of visits to this country. And every decade I find there are more and more people willing to experiment. Not experiment with molecules and atoms and the Hubble telescope, but willing to experiment with their faith. Willing to experiment with consciousness. Willing to experiment, say we are willing to do it. We have the faith and not putting a precondition that if this happens, then only we'll have faith. This development is what makes me feel that this is a year of change and the beginning of a decade of change. We'll enter into a century in which you can expect greater happiness. But remember, the law of creation, the law of physical creation says that creation in the physical world shall be bound by the pairs of opposites. If a large section of this world is happy, it will be counterbalanced by war, hatred, violence, somewhere else. It's unfortunate that happiness cannot be recognized by us in the physical world except in relation to unhappiness. That when one is manifesting, the other manifests at the same time. That days and nights both have to be there. You cannot say, let's have more light and therefore have only days. The days and nights come together to give us the value of light as seen against darkness. Therefore, while we are expecting a great change, that instead of being a remote, unusual, strange experience somewhere in the East, somewhere happening in a strange country. It can be an experience enjoyed by thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions of people of happiness. 
it will be accompanied by something happening against which that happiness can be measured. Where freedom can be experienced by large numbers, it will be measured against the lack of freedom that many others on the same planet are suffering. There are many well-wishers who would like the whole planet to be happy. But they fail to recognize that our experience of consciousness in this universe, in the physical plane, is based upon pairs of opposites. That if all of us were happy, we, none of us will be happy. That we will not know we are happy. That if there was no darkness and there was light all the time, nobody would have said there is light. That all these experiences are arising because of the opposites of it. The only thing I notice is the big shift in that strip that I talked to you about. The strip is shifting on the planet Earth and covering a larger area. But you will still have a section of the planet to confirm that a large section of those who missed out on happiness in the past are now getting happiness. So it's a change. This part of the Earth, the Americas, are exactly the opposite of the area which was covered by the strip early. If the earth turns around as a being, as a person, what was the face of the earth become the back of the earth? And if the back of the earth was driven to the wall to work and achieve and to make material gains, set up more factories, set up more industries and have wealth, the section that was happy with spirituality will be doing those things. And the ones who tried these experiments of economic development and getting great affluence and could not find happiness, will now find after that experience that they can find happiness by the change within. But both sections will still be there. The location is changing. This part of the earth is the part with promise. You will see it in this decade and in the turn of the century. You will see great spirituality growing here. I didn't run here for nothing. I came to sit and have a ringside seat. And the show starts. That's why I'm here to watch. And I hope many of you will watch the great significant changes that are taking place here. Thank you very much. Any questions? Is uh, anybody coming? Somebody must be coming for the workshop tomorrow. Those coming to the workshop, may raise their hands, please. I have an idea. Thank you. Anybody who's not coming to the workshop, please raise your hands. Okay, thank you. Uh, those not coming to the workshop, do they have any question? So those coming to the workshop will have all day to ask questions. Okay, then the questions are open to the whole floor. Anybody can ask any question. You can ask a question on what I have said or ask a question on what I have not said. That gives you ample scope. Yes. Well, when uh, you are uh, discussing with the market in the sense of uh, if you have the yin yang effect of uh, if someone's happy, someone's got to be poor or unhappy, uh, <clears throat> the thing that suggested itself to me was in the story of Christ coming, who they cover the multitude of spring relief. I've also been told, even by you, that the masters do the same thing. Now, does it take like Ten avatars to take care of the world, or uh, how, what is the role of? So it isn't just simple. If I'm if I'm happy, he's got to be unhappy. How did you get this number ten? Because <laughs> <laughs> so even the masters say that the happiness these people generate is confined to mark sheep. When you get a mark sheep, they get into the top. And the masters have explained the mark sheep have never been more than ten percent. <laughs> The human population. So it's not even half an But then I asked later on. Again, this way of confidence. Yes. Yeah, by inference, I how I know this is correct. It appears that you're saying that the industrialized world will experience more happiness in the years to come. And the unindustrialized world will become industrialized and therefore unhappy. Yes, the industrialized world that's got fed up of industry will look for happiness within. The industrialized world that wants to industrialize further will wait for the next phase. The unindustrialized world will go towards industry in order to find happiness. You're right. 
Yes. Do these people uh, who have been meditating together, uh, doing this thing together, do you think they really have an effect? Yes, it does have effect. But uh, it depends upon how they meditate. When we have a group meditation, I don't know how many of you have attended group meditations. I sometimes uh, go to, if I, there's a group meditation and when I'm present and I'm not meditating because I'm conducting it, so I have my eyes open and make others close their eyes, then I have a very good bird's eye view of what's going on. And many are looking from the eyes, who else is meditating and how? That doesn't have any effect. So it depends on how we meditate. If we meditate for show, it has no effect. If we meditate in the right way to find the self, it has effect all around. Even if 10% of people have real meditation, it will change the whole world. Yes? Yes. Yes. They may say, we have had too much of happiness, let's have a dip into a little unhappiness now. But that will be voluntary. Looks odd to you. Looks strange. When we are searching for happiness, it looks strange that happiness can be boring also after a while. If happiness is on a time sequence, we will have dips into unhappiness by our own choice. But if happiness is not on a time sequence, we will always be happy. Depends how deep we go in discovering our own self. When we find happiness by discovering the working of our own mind, our own body, our own senses, that happiness is still tied to time and can become boring. When we go beyond our body, beyond our senses, beyond our thoughts and still find happiness, that lasts forever. Yes. I have two questions. The first one is how you meditate, which is a good question. I, I, I've taken classes in meditating. But are you going to, tomorrow maybe, or whenever, tell yes. us how you do it and how you recommend doing it? Yes, tomorrow. And the second question I have is, I wonder if happiness is what we should be looking for. No, you should be looking for the self. Happiness is a byproduct. So, to answer her question, would you be happy in situations that normal, I mean, you know, I, I when she asked that question, I was thinking of, of the Jews during the death camp thing. I mean, that's a pretty stressful situation. You could hardly be happy in that situation. But if you weren't looking for happiness... Well, you could be happy if you found that you could change history. That's why I meant, because you were implying that you were looking for happiness, but I don't... You're looking for the truth and the self. Happiness is a byproduct. We don't per se look for happiness. We look for the truth. Happiness comes by itself. Yes. Um, I had in a dream a little voice that told me, uh, listen to yourself and you won't need to rely on the subconscious. Just believe in yourself. And that subconscious is all the world. And when I listen to myself, I ask for a lot of answers. And I get up. And I, it, it feels like I'm here another day. That's good. That's good. Self gives you the right answers. Subconscious gives you programmed answers. The difficulty arises that we don't know whether it's the subconscious or the self. Then you need little guidance to distinguish between the subconscious and the self. We'll talk of it in the workshop tomorrow. But if you hear the self, it gives you a glimpse of paradise. Subconscious is programmed. Yes. The people that are really happy find that they're often the brunt of uh, jealousy from people that are unhappy. So they get more coming down on them than other people sometimes? Oh yeah, jealousy. You have anything which people desire and you are the subject of jealousy. So you Happiness is the most desirable. <laughs> and therefore you have a lot of jealous people. Even if you get little things of the world which give you temporary happiness, people are jealous. Jealousy is a great characteristic of the egoistic mind. So you find a lot of jealousy wherever you find a lot of ego. They both go together. But the person who is happy should be able to rise above the jealousy. Yes? Yes. At a stage when there is no time, you have both together. If you go above the mind, there is no such thing as being happy or unhappy at different times because there is only one time. So all the experiences occur in the same moment called now. 
it's a experience above the mind. Yes. So the fact that the industrial that more people in the industrialized world are getting happy and have any effect, if any, what would it be on the unindustrialized world? What would the relationship be between the industrialized world where there's more people getting happy? The industrialized world, the newly industrialized world will think these people are fools. They got all they wanted and they have become fools to look for happiness somewhere else. There is no such thing as happiness except in material welfare. A statement we had heard earlier too from this section of the earth which, when it was growing as an industrial power. Yes. You turn over the fruits of your industry to them. You take this and if you have something better give it to us. They will say, they are fools. Just for taking one Mahatma or one uh, mystic from here, they are willing to give over a factory worth a million dollars. It's a good deal. We think it's cheap. Yes. Yes. Otherwise, you won't call it happiness. If you have happiness followed by happiness, there is no change. The experience of happiness is in relation to relationship to what we are having now. So you have to go through unhappiness to be able to appreciate happiness. To appreciate happiness means to experience happiness. Wealth, yes, last question. Would you say that the uh, ultimate uh, essence of being is polar or dual in nature or would you say it is one in nature? The ultimate real essence of being, the ultimate real essence of being, being ultimate is one not polarized. But to talk of an ultimate real being, we are relating it to the unreal being that we become here. Therefore, you can reframe the statement in this way. We are in a world of polarity. We are in a world of duality. We are in a world of pairs of opposites. No experience can take place here except in pairs of opposites. And when we go above this, we go into a world that is unitary, has no opposites. Although it has no opposites, it automatically becomes the opposite of this. So while there is no polarity or duality in the ultimate, the ultimate itself is the polarization of the world of polarity. You're clever. <laughs> With this last comment, I think I should now say thank you and good night and we'll meet you tomorrow.